this week in Lithuania, we commemorate Day of Local Governance. We are very proud of that. And the purpose of our conference is as well to commemorate Day of uh, Local Governance, but in different way. So we commemorate it as researchers. We are very happy to have this conference six time. So six years, year by year, we have the research community from all the Europe. And today, as you could see from our small flags, we should have there 13 countries. And it's not just countries. It's our colleagues, it's our research community that we uh, divided our own research works to local governance. And we have not just number of countries. This year, we have number of different parts of the world. We have guests from uh, United States, and we are very happy to have there our sister city uh, representatives from Omaha University. And we have, first time in our conference, um, guest researcher professor from South Korea. And of course, there are new in our conference guests from Georgia. So really, wide geography shows that this thematical area, this problem, problematical area is very important for us. So my congratulations from on behalf of all scientific committee, all organizing committee, and I really wish you very fruitful discussions and hope that result of our discussion will affect practice as well. Could I start from congratulations? We are very happy to have today in this plenary session really plenty of our colleagues and I could say our friends from local municipality, from uh, uh, parliament of uh, uh, Lithuania and from um, governance could you please, what is in English, governance, representative of governance in Shulai County. So could I start and ask to uh, say some words, our, I could say, colleague. Uh, now he is a part or member of Lithuanian parliament. Uh, and I invite here a member of Lithuanian parliament, Arunas Gmunauskas our former colleague. No, I should get to the first question, but see, most of us, that's good, that's what's needed. Here, uh, you must have heard of a shake in this room, you have set up. Kuriškinę paisant, jūsų, sakyčiau, įdėlių aukštą mokslo reformų, tvirtai eina savo keliu, tęsia mokslinius tyrimus. Aš labai džiaugiuosi, kad ši konferencija yra tikrai reprezentatyvi, iš kurių daug yra valstybių vėliavas, matau. Ir šiuo momentu Šiauliai tampa tokių tabautiškų mokslinės minties raidos centru. Aš tikiu, kad šios konferencijos atsiras mokslinės publikacijos. Galbūt kai kurios mokslinkus pastumės iki tą patirtis ne tik apsiripoti straipsnių, bet ir eiti to laulink monografijos. Taigi, visus labai sveikinu Šiauliuose, kadangi tai yra mano miestas irgi. Ir aš linkiu gero pabūdimo Šiauliuose, gerų įspūdžių ir, aišku, įsivežti su savim į savo tėvynę gerąją mokslo patį. Ačiū labai, Seimonarį. 
Uh, now I want to invite the, what is the right word, the master of Shoule, uh, the Shoule city mayor, Artur Svisotskas. Geografija mokslininkų, kurie atvyko į Šiaulių, sako, jog vietos savivaldos problematika yra visame pasaulyje. Tikiuosi, kad diskusijose bus parasti nauji keliai arba įdvirtinti esami pasiekimai. Ir labai viliuosi, jog diskusijose bus nemažai praktinio elemento ir po to, Universitetas padarys apibendrinimą ir jį pristatys Šiaulių miesto taryboje visiems politikams, kad žinotumėm, kas vyksta mieste ir kas yra surasta. Dinkiu geros konferencijos, ypač žiaugiuosiu miestų partnerių Omaha ir konkrečiai Carol Abdono, kuris atvyko iš Šiaulius. Tai dėkoju taip pat be jokios abejonės, neįmanoma nematyti Lietų Korėjos mokslininką Šiauliuose. Na, tikiuosi, kad šitas mažas burys garantuoja kokybę, nes, žinot, paprastai gali būti labai daug žmonių ir turbūti galbūt mažiau kokybės, tai tikiuosi, kad darbo grupės bus ypač kokybiškas, ypač, kaip sakant, rezultatyvės. Ir kitais metais atvažiavę, galbūt vėl diskutuosim jau turbūti kitų kampo. Taigi, parneškite gerą žinias iš Šiaulių į savo šalis ir praleiskite, čia likusi gerą laiką, kiek žinau, Profesorius iš Korėjos yra nuo antradienio, tai klausiau, kaip čia mum, kaip čia jums ta šalis ir kiek čia to lietaus. Sužinau, kad ten lyja dvi savaitės. Tai galiu pasakyti, kad pas mus irgi panašiai, tik čia truputį oras pajokavo, paprastai rūdienis yra gražius Lietuvoj, tai būtinai atvykite ir kitais metais, kad galėtumėt įsitikinti geros konferencijos. Dėkojame merui. Now I want to invite one of our, I think that very close friends. It's not friendship as personal, but friendship as professional. Asta Yesunine from representative of Lithuanian governance. Please. Labai dieną, kirbėmį konferencijos dalyvį, kadangi vyriausybės atstovas irgi kalbėjai su lietuviškai. Iš tikrųjų, džiugu šiandien mes susirinkom Šiulių universitete ir kalbam apie gerą valdymą vietos savivaldai. Labai balonu, kad Šiulių universiteto mokslininkai minėdami savo įstaigus 20 metį, atlieka įvairius mokslinius tyrimus ir dalyvauja šitam procese prisidėdami prie vietos savivaldos daugulinimo, sakyčiau. Mūsų įstaigos tikslas irgi manyčiau toks pat. Mes irgi norime, kad vietos savivaldo būtų stipri, skaidri ir atitiktų visus Lietuvos įstatymus. Tai iš tikrųjų šiandien sveikinu jūs, linkiu geros konferencijos ir tikiuosi, kad mūsų visų bendras tikslas stiprinti Lietuvos savivaldą iš tikrųjų šiandien bus Šitas reikinys prisidės prie to tikslo. Thank you so much. Now I want to invite our as well good colleagues and I really am very happy about some partnership with two really serious organizations. One of them and those both organizations will be represented or is represented today by Alfredas Jonuška. So, please. Labas rytas. Good morning, everybody. I welcome you in Chaulé, in Chaulé University, in this nice place. And uh, I'm happy that you are there and uh, you will discuss, uh, I think, very important issues. Governance, governance, uh, public governance and uh, municipality governance. For me, it would be easy if I switch on in the Lithuanian, I would, would say much more ideas about this. Okay? Uh, 
rajonas, pas mažesnės negu miestas, ir taip pat verslo organizacijų. Tai yra Šiaulių prekybos pramonės matovumai, tai yra verslo organizacija, kuri vienija versininkus. Ir man ši konferencija taip pat yra įdomi, kodėl. Kadangi jūs šia prisirašė labai daug raktinių žodžių, gal aš paminėsiu keletą, kurie man yra labai svarbus ir įdomus. Tai yra tokie kaip geras administravimas, viešasis valdymas, geras valdymas, dalyvavimų grįstas valdymas. Paskutinė frazė aš taip būtų pabrėščiau. Dalyvavimų grįstas valdymas. Ką tai reiškia, kad visi piliečiai, kurie gyvena toje teritorijoje, savaldybėse, jos tikrai galėtų įsivėti į valdymą ir tikrai jį gerinti savo iniciatyvomis. Vyksta šiaugose, vyksta kitose savaldybėse toks procesas ir manau, kad yra sveikintina, o aš kaip iš verslo organizacijos tikrai mes taip pat aktyviai bandom įsivėti į šį procesą, teikdami siūlymus. Tačiau būna ir nesutarimų, o kodėl jie kyla? Kadangi verslo to būti yra paprasčiau. Jie žino, kas yra valdymas įmonėje ir visi mato aišku rezultatą. Pagiminau, pardavėjau, išmokėjau atsvykinimą, proverto tatas aiškus, jeigu visas procesas vyksta gerai, valdymas puikus. Savaldybėse yra situacija kitokia. Ten apčiupti rezultatą yra daug sudėtingiau, vyksta įvairius procesai, visuomeniniai procesai, judėjimai, Ir tikrai tą rezultatą pasiekti yra daug, daug sudėtingiau, nes visų akis krypsta ir verslo, ir bendruomenių, ir visuomenės, o kas ten vyksta, kodėl taip vyksta, kodėl dėšiai finansai naudojami vienai par kitaip ir tai dalyvavimas, dalyvavimų grįstas valdymas turbūt ir pateisintų tai, kad būtų galima aiškiau paaiškinti visuomeniai apie vykstačius procesus ir kodėl taip vyksta. Iš tikro, Norėčiau pabrėžti, kad Šiaulių universitetas, kiek man tenka dalyvauti vairiuose tose procesuose, be gero valdymo valdybėse, aktyviai dalyvauja su tyrimais, su pristatomaja medžiaga, jie atlieka įvairius darbus, tie, kurie padeda ir meroms, ir savalybių tarybams priimti sprendimus, kurie būtų grįsti jau ne tik emocija, bet grįsti ir duomenimis ir Atikim, mokslų. Tai yra labai svarbu. O iš tikrųjų dar vienas įdomumas yra, kad mes Lietuva, savaldybės yra gana mūsų tokios stambios. Iškiai tikrai gyventojai savaldybės yra gana daug. Palygintų mes su kaimynais Latvijais ar Estais, jos tik dabar bando optimizuoti procesus ir optimizuoti savaldybės, jas jungdami įvairiais ten saldainius dalindamos ir taip toliau, kadangi supranta, kad turbūt gero valdymai gyvendinti, mažesnės yra daug sudėtingiau. Tikrai mes galime pasičiaukti iš tokią reformą, kurį Lietuvoje buvo įgyvendinta, savadybės sujungtos įstambesnės. Tačiau nepamirštume, kad ir tai kelia įvairių iššūkių, ką reikia Lietuvoje turbūt spręsti. O įspręsti tikrai receptų nėra vieno, reikia dialogų, bandravimų visuomenėje, galime bet kokią problemą įspręsti. Aš manau, kad jūs konferencijos šioje tikrai pasidalinsite patingai mūsų svečiai įvairiom patirtim, įvairiais receptais, kurios galbūt ir mūsų visuomenės su mūsų gebėjimu, su mūsų matymu ir mūsų mentalitetu tikrai paėgtume adaptuoti, pritaikyti arba pasinaudoti tomis naujovėmis. Tikrai ačiū visiems uždalyvavimą, tikrai linkiu šios konferencijos gerų rezultatų, o išvadas tikrai mes skaitysim, vertinsim ir tikrai iš anksto dėkojim. Ačiū visiems. Now I want to invite a representative from your parliament, Giedrė Brazilskaitė. She wants to pass some congratulations to our conference as well. Labadiena visiem. Smagu jūs visus matyti. Noriu perduoti linkėjimus iš Europos parlamento, nuo Europos parlamento narių, Valentino Mazuronio. Šiaulių universiteto viešo administravimo katedros pasirinkta mokslinių tyrimų kreipis, gero valdymo realizavimas vietos savildoje, prisideda prie Europos vietos savildos hartijos nuostatų įgyvendinimo. Itin vertinga, kad net kelias šios tyrėjų bendruomenės mokslininkės yra prie Europos tarybos vietos ir regiono valdžių kongreso veikiančios Europos vietos savildos hartijos nepriklausomų ekspertų grupės narės. Tai puikus mokslo ir praktikos sąsojos pavyzdys. Taigi, sveikiname šią mokslo bendruomenę ir linkime savo darbais 
stiprintis savivaldos idėjos klaidą. O nuo savęs palinkėčiau, kad mokslinti rimai tarsi patektų į socialinį tinklą Facebook ir sulauktume daugiausią laikų. Sėkmės šiandieną. Ačiū labai. Na ir visą šitą sveikinimų sesiją kviešiu užbaigti mūsų rektorių, šeimininką šito universiteto pradžio. Good morning, colleagues. Pepe's language for me is mathematic language. Mathematic is science language. I speak in Lithuania. Mėly konferencijos svečiai, pirmiausia valdžios atstovai, kaip juos jūs visus, kurie dar likote, mėly kolegos mokslininkai, mėly užsienio svečiai, Sveikinu jūs visus šeštojai tarptautiniai konferencijai ir iš kartų noriu linkėti, kad šitą konferenciją tikrai nebūtų paskutinė. Kokį norit skaitminį prie jos dėkit, geriausia būtų, kad atverskim šeštų kantrai ir sulaukim bent jau devinto. O būtų minimalus tikslas. Man labiau šiai konferencijos tematikui užstrigo socialinės gerovės valstybės, socialinės gerovės plėtra. Šitie žodžiai. 21 amžiaus, minčiniški greičiai, problemų iššūkčių daugiausia, kuriant socialinė gerovė turbūt visi rastame pakankamai nemažai įvairiausiai iššūkių, tiek demografijos, tiek ekonomijos, tiek šeimos, tiek kultūrinių ir taip toliau ir taip toliau. Ir aš galvoju, kad apie viską šiandien jūs nespėsit dar pakalbėti, liks kai kurių temų ratyčiai. Universitetų vaidmuo šitame procese. Nežinau, kaip čia ar aš per daug nepasakysiu prieš tai universiteto atžvilgiu, bet mano galva, kad universitetuose ir mes irgi ne viską padarom. Mes ruošiam žmonės apginkluotus 21-ojo amžiaus tebuklais, galinčius atlikti sudėtingiausias analizės, priimti labai greitai įvairiausius sprendimus, bet užmirštam vieną iš pagrindinių universiteto misijų, kad universitetas turi ruošti ne tik pačios aukščiausios pravo specialistą, bet ir asmenybę žmogų. Visi šitie supergabus apkinkluoti šio vaikinėm technologijų žmonės turi pagalvoti apie tai, kad jie turėtų, aš manau, jie norėtų gyventi padarių žmonių visu vartu. Eidamas į šitą konferenciją paskaičiau filosofo Algirdo Mitskūno mintį, kuris apie šitos dalykos pasakė filosofiškai tai. Mes atrodo esam užšokę ant panteros, ant gazelės, ar ant kokio kito greitai bėgančių žvėrės. Ir lekiam didelių greičių, bet kur lekiam, nelabai suvokiu. Man kaip matematikui ir fizikui, fizikui yra dvi savokos. Nu, į tas kelias ir povas. Tai čia ir netoli tokį išvadą. Sukamės didelių greičių, skrendam, neaišku kur, bet vis pajutė realybės ir randam tam pačiam taškiai. Tai yra to poslinkio. Tai yra tiek daug, kiek norėjau. Taigi visiems jom ir savo linkiu, kad sprendimai būtų netikreiti, teisingi, bet kad jie mosvestų į tam tikrą tikslą. Universitetas, universitetui linkiu ir pats stengsis kolegų nusiryti. Tai, kad universitetas ne tik patai kautų visuomeniai, ypatingai valdžiai, o būtytų asmenybės, būtytų pačią visuomenę, kuri tikrai 
galimis pasitikti. Nori gyventi socialinės gerovės gerovės. Taip, ko geriausios klotės ir iki kitų pasivatymų. Ačiū. Ačiū žvilti. So, thank you for everyone. Those congratulations are really supporting us, because sometimes we feel like lost in this rushing, as our director said. So for calming and for coming down and for making our rules even deeper, I invite you to start our plenary session. And as you have in your uh, program, we will have four presentations. I, I invite presenters to take uh, their seats near the, uh, our table. So please, Professor Carol Erdon from United States. Um, uh, Professor, I, I am so not easy to pronounce his name, but Professor from Korea. <laughs> so could you please take your seat? Uh, Professor Veta Reinholder, please, she will be my colleague helping me moderate this section. Uh, and now we will start our uh, quite interesting, I could say, uh, and very um, uh, sometimes shocking presentations. And after that, we will have discussion. We will, uh, so if, if you have some questions after each presentation, please keep it until the end of, of all four presentations. And after that, we will have some panel discussion about that. So, Professor Kellogg, please. Thank you, Professor Kellogg. Thank you, Professor Good morning. Thank you, Vilma. Very happy to be here in Chalet again. I was here two years ago, so I'm very, very happy to see everyone again. I know I met many of you then. I'm going to talk today about uh, two areas in the U.S. that are um, very common, citizen engagement and public-private partnerships. And I do research in both of these areas, and I've begun to think a lot about how they connect, or more, more likely, how they don't connect, and how the use of these new forms of partnerships are in some ways reducing the ability of citizens to participate and engage. So just to give you an overview of local government financing and how it works in the US, you can see that uh, the general revenue of local governments, 64% of it comes from local sources. And only 36% comes from other levels of government. And most of that 36% is for schools, the operation of schools. State governments give money to local governments for that. So most of the money that local governments have is decided on at the local level, not at the state or federal level. Of that revenue that they uh, come from themselves, 65% of it is from taxes. So quite a bit of money comes from local taxes that are decided on at the local level. And this could be property tax or sales tax or income tax. Those are the major taxes that we have. So it's very important, since these decisions are made locally, it's very important for citizens to be involved in those decisions and understand what's going into those decisions. And there's a lot of academic literature on the benefits of participation. And I think many of you are very aware of these things. So it's, it can help to build trust. Uh, increase transparency so citizens know more about the decisions that are being made. It can help to educate citizens, particularly on complex and, and uh, very convoluted topics. Uh, it helps citizens oversee what's going on in government. Uh, it also can be used to help um, people learn and be able to become future leaders and become good leaders, and it helps to build community. So there are a number of, of important reasons why we think participation is really important. And in the US, we have a long tradition of public involvement in local decisions. There are very many laws and rules and regulations that require governments to involve citizens in decision making at the local level. So this goes, long, goes back a long way. 
Uh, one thing is that we elect local officials, mayors, city council members, school board members, uh, county county level commissioners. But we have lo very low voter turnout. I know the last time I was here two years ago, you were talking about your voter turnout in local elections. And I think you were upset that it was about 70%. Well, you can see here that in our last race for mayor, our last election for mayor, only 35% of voters came out to vote. So very, very low participation in elections. We also have a lot of participation in areas that, that revolve around zoning, uh, what types of businesses or residences can be in certain parts of the city, uh, and planning for the future for the community. So again, there are many, many rules about this. It's a very open process. Many public hearings are required. If something is going to happen and is proposed to happen in a certain neighborhood of the city, then the citizens have to be notified. There will be meetings in that neighborhood. So, and many people come out to discuss and talk about these things. Uh, we also, most cities have an appointed board for planning and for zoning. Uh, made up of citizens, regular citizens, and so there's a lot of participation in these types of decisions. I do research in public finance, so I always want to talk about the financial aspects. We, uh, most states, all of our states, have rules that citizens have to um, be able to participate in various ways in the budget process. So at the local level, there are always public meetings. The budget document has to be available for the public to see if they want to see it, usually online, in larger communities at least. Uh, so again, there's a lot of transparency here. Many communities go well beyond the, the formal requirements. They will have, they might have citizen committees to review the budgets. Uh, they might have workshops early in the process to talk about what citizens want. They might do opinion surveys to find out what citizens want. And in some cases, people even vote on budget issues or on tax new taxes or tax increases. And then for capital projects, which are more long-term projects, such as building a building or building roads, we often have a different process because this is a long-term plan for how our city is going to grow. And so we typically will have maybe a five-year capital improvement plan. And again, the public is very involved in this. It's a, it's a long process that occurs over, over time and citizens might be asked what they want, what their priorities are. There are public meetings. Again, often there are citizens involved in, um, in on boards to make these decisions and, and deciding which have higher priority. Uh, when governments issue debt to pay for something where they're borrowing money, often the citizens have to vote on that, uh, on that debt issuance. So again, budgeting is, um, uh, uh, participation is very common in many of the things that we do at local government level in the U.S. But there are a lot of issues with this. As I mentioned with the voting, not many people are interested. There is a lot of apathy among citizens. They're very busy. They work full time. They have families. They don't have time to participate. And they're not really sure how. The issues are complicated. They don't understand budgets very well. And it's hard to explain to them. Uh, and so it's very difficult. It's, always, it's also hard to get a representative uh, group of participants. So you may get people that come out that are very interested in one issue because they're very passionate about that at a certain point in time. People that don't care that much might not come out. Uh, and, so, and there are also many, many local government levels in the U.S. So in Omaha, where I'm from, for example, we have a city government, a county government, a school district, uh, and then many other smaller governments. And so it's very complicated and hard for people to understand. There's also been quite a bit of research that even where citizens are involved, that often their input doesn't end up affecting the final decisions. Uh, and of course, it takes time and money to, act, to have active participation, which many communities don't have. So participation has many issues to it. but. We should not stop trying to uh, encourage it because it is important and can have some very big benefits. So I'm going to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships and how these are increasing. And there are a number of reasons why they are increasing in the U.S. now. I think three of the big ones are that um, 
uh, our local governments have less fewer resources than we used to. We went through the Great Recession, and many local governments have still not recovered from that. Uh, they might have pension funds that they owe over a long term money to their employees that that they need to, that they will need to raise to have. Many states have limitations on the taxes that local governments can impose, and so they can't. They only have the ability to raise taxes so much. And there are also uh, many people in the U.S. that are opposed to taxes, and they believe that they can have lots of services but not have to pay for them. Uh, and so that's that's a problem for elected officials. Uh, and then we also have many many complex issues to deal with: poverty, crime, health care. Um, homelessness. Those are all very big issues that one local government alone can't deal with. And so there's an increasing use of partnering with many different organizations to solve these things. And then finally, there is an increased demand for government to be involved in providing services. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but mostly for economic development, for tourism, um, for, for entertainment type activities. So I'm going to talk about three specific types of partnerships. The first is the traditional public-private partnership that is common in most of the rest of the world, but is just really beginning in the US. We have not used these very long-term contractual agreements with the private sector before. Uh, so we're, we're just, just starting to do this with things like running airports, uh, running utilities, water utilities, sewer utilities, gas and electric. So we're just starting to do this. Uh, and one example of this is uh, the city of Chicago a few years ago contracted with a company to do a partnership over 75 years. So it's very long-term agreement uh, for their parking meters. So this is when people go downtown and they park. We charge them to park there. And this is widely considered in the US to be an example of how not to do a public-private partnership. It has not worked very well. The, the agreement was very poorly written, and it's had very negative effects on the city. The city did receive over $1 billion for it for the 75 years, which they received up front. But then they used the money, almost all the money, right away to balance their budget, because this was during the Great Recession. So most of the money is already gone, and there are still 65 years left in this agreement. So this was, this was very hard for participation because most of these deals are done not in our normal way, which is very publicly. Everything is open and transparent. But these deals are very complicated, and they're mostly done in private through negotiations. And so the public isn't really aware of it until the contract is ready to be voted on by the, by the governing body. And so there's not much room for public input. There's not. There's, no, there's not enough effort made to explain these complex deals. They're very long term, so the public isn't able to have input over the long term. And they don't have much input into what's going to happen with the money. The second type of uh, partnership I'm going to mention is that uh, local governments are starting to get into what I call businesses that are things that have traditionally been done by the private sector, but now governments are starting to do them. And one example of this is hotels. We, um, we have many cities and counties now in the US that actually own hotels, which has never been the case before. They've always been owned by the private sector. So now public sector is competing with the private sector. And the reason we do these is because we're increasingly building convention centers and arenas and, and sports facilities where you need hotels next to them for people to want to come and go to those events. And so cities have gotten into this business. And it's uh, very private. Uh, because it's a business, it's often operated more like a business. And, and uh, the information is not publicly available about how the businesses are, how the hotels are performing. They're usually run by another organization, which might be a private organization. And so the public rules about public meetings, public information, those don't apply in many cases here. And oftentimes, the public doesn't even know that they own that hotel. We have a city-owned hotel in Omaha, which is run by Hilton Hotels. And so it says Hilton on the name of it. And most of people in the city of Omaha have no idea that they own that hotel. 
So again, here's something where they had no input into the process, they didn't vote on anything, and yet the city has the ultimate responsibility if the hotel does not perform well. The third thing I want to mention is gifts to government. This is another thing that is becoming increasingly common in the U.S. where donors, either individual donors or, or organizations such as a foundation, gives money to government for some specific purpose. And again, this, is, this seems to be increasing in popularity. And there are some big examples of this. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, Bill Gates from Microsoft Corporation. Uh, they have a big foundation that has given hundreds of millions of dollars to public libraries and schools. And there's some criticism about, about that. Um, we have a local example in Omaha where we built a new baseball stadium a few years ago. And it was funded partially, $43 million out of the $140 million total came from private donations. And that sounds wonderful. And it's nice to think that the private sector is interested in helping support government. But the problem with that is then that group of people ends up making the decisions. So this project was driven very largely by the elites in the city of Omaha because they wanted the stadium. So we didn't go through the normal process. I talked earlier about the capital planning process. Well, this project never showed up in that plan. It was not on the radar and until the elites came in and wanted the stadium built. And so, in, and so we never had the discussion about, is this stadium a higher priority than a police station or a library? And so, so this causes some concerns. And there were some concerns in Omaha about this project, that the citizens were not involved, uh, and that it was the donors that had the biggest influence over this project. So given those three types of partnerships, I think there's, there's reason to be pessimistic about citizen participation, uh, because, because I think these types of partnerships are increasing. So I think it tends to limit the amount of transparency, the amount of information that citizens get, their involvement in the whole decision process. Often citizens don't understand who's ultimately accountable, which usually they're the ones that are accountable, but they don't really know it. Uh, and, and it tends often to be the elites and, the, and private interests that are making the big decisions or have the most influence over the decisions, which ends up leading to big issues of efficiency and equity. So I think there are some, some big concerns here that we need to address. On the other hand, I think there is some reason to be optimistic because we have some other things that are happening that I think are helping to increase the potential for participation. One of these is called civic crowdfunding. And this is a way to use internet technology uh, as a platform for small donations for certain projects. So for instance, the city might want to build a new library, but they don't have the money. And so they can use one of these platforms. One of these, there's a company that will do this. And small donors can donate $1, $5, $10, with whatever they can afford and want to give for this specific project. And so it's a good way for the general public to be involved in thinking about what, is, what are their highest priorities. Another example is co-production of services, which is also increasing. We have 311 systems in the US in many areas where citizens can report, for instance, if there's a hole in the street, a pothole. And then they can track when it gets fixed. So they can be very involved in services, or they can be more involved in policing services, and where the police need to be at a given point in time. So again, this is another way for citizens to get involved. A lot, many communities use citizen satisfaction surveys to find out how well the citizens believe they are performing or where they need to spend, put more efforts. Uh, and then finally, online technology has really been helpful in terms of people being able to participate more. There's a, there are a lot more ways for them to give online input. Uh, now again, there are equity issues with that because some lower income people don't have access to those technologies but it, it, it at least broadens the ability for people to participate. So overall, I think there are some concerns, but I think that we're finding some ways to, um, to increase participation in other ways. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And if uh, someone has questions, please leave them until the end of the session, and we will have these uh, plenary or this panel discussion at the end. I want to ask uh, to present 
sorry, <laughs> for, for pronunciation. A uh, professor. Oh, yeah, <laughs> young. So please take your place, and the room is yours. Good morning. My name is not easy to pronounce it. <laughs> My name is Yam Tor Lee. I'm from South Korea, Chandam National University. Chandam National University has a student exchange program with the Shonlai University. Um, through that way, I came to know this conference, and then I'm very honored to present the case. Um, there are some big words here. Uh, good governance, smart growth, shrinking cities. I cannot go over all of this, but um, I have to say something about the, what governance, by governance, what I meant. Um, so I'll go this way. Um, many cities are experiencing decline of population, so they have to find some way to deal with it. I heard that uh, from rector that the uh, Shalai lost a lot of um, students and people in the past 10 years. So how can a small city deal with those issues? That is a topic of my study. Today, I'm just going to give you an illustration of building good governance in a, some part of a small city. And um, smart growth meaning when the resources are limited, you have to find a way not planning for the expansion, but planning for some of the Going smaller, keeping um, everything not in terms of expansion, but maintaining current resources and um, making the quality of life better. So that is the idea of smart growth. And then for the governance, I need to explain some. Um, in Korea, we have a saying that uh, you are brave when you are ignorant. That is the case for me. I didn't know that uh, you have the conference on governance six to five times. And then if I knew it, then uh, I may be hesitant to come here. But then um, I was brave enough because I was ignorant of the situation. But still, um, I'd like to explain what I meant by governance because there are a lot of talks, but um, it's not easy to define. And then I will use a case of South Korean case how that idea of governance worked to solve the problem of um, poor area in Seoul. When people, you know, governance was not popular until early 1990s, and then from that time on, for 10 years, everybody started to talk about the governance. So 2000, year of 2000, there are many, many talks on governance. But what do you mean by governance? There are three ways of organizing economic activities. And then economists usually say it will be by market or by government, by authority. Then, um, Walter Power, who is a sociologist, think about the other kind of organizing. You know, people that only buy market transactions come together to solve a problem. It is not the, organi the government organization which solves the problem. Sometimes there is a network of people, very loosely organized, but trust-based, and then reciprocity, Reputations are very important in um, doing, getting together to solve the common purpose, to solve the problem. So there will be a market forms of organization, hierarchy forms of organization, and network forms of organization. I would say that the, these three forms are all forms of governance. 
But when we say more specifically governance, we frequently refer to natural type of organization. So that, that's what I meant by governance here. And then <clears throat> Korean case will show that uh, uh, non-government organizations, residents, and the local district government got together with the idea of network. In network, we see that the in market, all the activities are based on contract, price mechanism. And then their relationships, uh, commitments are very low, doesn't care, just, just uh, if the price is right, they act. If the price is not right, they will yeah, dissolve. But in network, um, people want to solve the problem. The problems are sometimes not very clearly defined, but working together, find a way to uh, resolve the problem. So commitment level is very high. Their um, attitude to each other, open-minded, uh, open-ended, and work for the uh, mutual benefits for a relatively long time of the period. Recently, I'm interested in the uh, problem of urban shrinkage, and the urban shrinkage is called a wicked problem. Wicked not in the sense of evil, uh, wicked in a sense that, that the problem is very resistant to solution. Urban problems are usually uh, the problem. Actually, the idea of a wicked problem was proposed by urban planners, uh, scholars of urban planners, because Many issues are interrelated. If you solve one problem, you know, that solution may cause another problem in other areas. So it requires constant involvement of stakeholders to solve the problem. And the urban problem, urban shrink case is a typical case of making the problem. So how to solve the problem? By market, by government, or by network? Network may be the most effective way sometimes. And I'll show you the Korean case. With PPT, I cannot see the time. <laughs> so, tell me the time. Okay. Um, I was going to give you two examples, one from Korea and one from um, Japan, but I, I'll focus on the Korean case. This is the village on the slope of um, in Seoul called Changsu village. And Changsu village is, uh, as you can see, on the slip, on the, on the steep uh, here. It is uh, not very large, 19,000 square meter, meaning that probably, you know, 500 and 400 meters, not very big area, but the narrow alleys located on the steep slope on the rocks. And then there are about 160 units of buildings and 300 households. And then very old people live there, the poor people, and then public facilities are not easy to provide because the situation in that field. It was developed when Seoul, de Seoul grew in the 1960s and 70s. So they are, most, some of them are squatters. They are just occupying the public land without the authority from the city. And then as Seoul grew, and then as the buildings get older and older, there is a need to replace it, or refurbish it, renovate it. So the so that area, this is the situation of that village. And then Seoul was expanding, and then Seoul is getting richer, try to, you know, remove some ugly part of the villages. And then 
there was a CTO who was repaired, repaired, and then parks were also installed. And then Jiangsu village, you know, just all the um, rundown buildings and the government to have to do provide these services to the residents. So 2004, that village was designated as redevelopment plan site, meaning that private actors can invest to replace that area, mostly by high rises apartment complex. But this area is not that big and under, you know, very uh, steep slope. So private actors did not want to invest in that area. In the flat area, if, if you build an apartment complex, the 10, 10, 10 story building, then the investors will get the money by selling the uh, rest of the, uh, the occupants will take the, you know, some part of the apartment complex and then others will be sold. So the uh, private investor makes money, but that, by that way, but in this case, it was not easy to do that because of the slope. The village was founded on the rocks. So to remove the rocks, make it flat, is not easy. And then because of the, there is a landscape regulations, it was not also easy to build high rises in the area. So no one wants to solve the problem. And then the government wanted uh, residents some squatters to pay for the occupation of the pu public land. So that became a problem. And then that's where uh, you search for alternative way to regeneration began. It was begun by non-NGO groups, started by non-NGO groups, and involving residents, nature, government, and private actors. So it was the new uh, search for the alternative program began 2008. Four years later, they came up with a new idea, not replacing by apartment complex, but by innovating and redesigning some part of the village. And then how did they do it? by taking the approach, governance approach. And then I'll show you how they did it. So Changsu village was located, you know, somewhere like that area, and then new city wall was built, and the government wanted to remove or do something, but failed to do it and private actors had no interest in that area. So it is a case of uh, making an urban village. To make an urban village, it is required to have um, physical remaking. And social remaking is also very important to make that village livable, pleasurable for the residents. To do that, the, the Government organizations have to be involved. There are uh, four phases of making new plan by involving people. First uh, phase is the formation of a study group and alternative development uh, project. These are names of non government organizations, they are against government's way of regeneration of a rundown areas of Seoul city. So they form a study group and then got a field research, find the problems, not only by the um, NGO, they involved people. So they had a resident meetings and the workshops, explanation meeting, and then publish the newsletter about the possible way of regenerating that area. 
So after about a half a year later, they provide the first draft for the alternative project with best plan. It was important that uh, it was a search for an alternative first time in that area. And then also important that because many residents involved, they thought that, well, you know, there's no way all the people were well, just I like to live as it is. But um, people began to think, well, probably other, there are other possibilities without pouring their own money and or without uh, external money, external big money. And then NGO groups um, encouraged the residents to form a resident council. You know, government officials cannot go uh, every time to explain. It is up to the residents to organize um, involving you know, as, many, as many people as possible. So, and then after the study group and resident council had joint meeting, what are the alternatives? What other cities are doing with the, the similar issues? And then the resident council had a several resident assembly and discussed all the relevant issues together. So original idea was that, oh, you know, new urban type of housing will be good and then they preferred um, townhouse but after the talk and meetings and discussion they found that well to do that some of residents who live there more than 20 years have to be kicked out so they agreed well that's not the way so they <clears throat> they chose to repair and renovate as the alternative to rebuild um, their village. And it's important to, to, it's important to involve the people constantly without losing the momentum. So they did a lot of various community activities, made a little museum, and plant maps was distributed to beautify the surroundings and the field research and alleys. These are the series of activities organized by NGO and resident council. So they want you to have a desired um, for plan for the rebuilding of the village. They work together and then paintings and the phase four is uh, to repair and uh, renovate the houses um, around this time three years later government the district office commissioned that study group to have a, a complete investigation of the situation um, visiting every household of the of the village. And then they also made a social enterprise called Village Carpentry. Uh, some of the residents are you know, manual workers. They have a skills in, in rebuilding, repairing the houses. So they, they had a social enterprise and then that was recognized by the government. Uh, could get some assistance from the government. So they change it to some part of it and then have people to have the confidence in the uh, new project. This is in Korea. This is the government, the local district um, Tesco Force. They have eight members of Tesco Force to support um, social economy, environment, Switch um, roads and security. So the at the later stage, the government involved, and then they, the NGOs, residents, and government has a, a joint meeting 
to explain you know what their plans are to the possible uh, private actors who are interested in that project so building the governance is important to solve the, the issues of the Changsu uh, village and then the most important thing is to involve people so the um, president outside experts consultants NGOs and local governments are all involved in the in the four year term uh, injection I would say there are three major processes in in the process the first was uh, preliminary research and planning um, outside exports was utilized for that um, aspect I would say that um, using the term of governance network governance it was not the hierarchy it, it was not the market private actors was not interested at the beginning and the government did not know what to do but then outside NGOs um, moved a new moved in a new direction and they provide um, possible ways to regenerate the area. Um, second part is organization of residents. It's very important that the residents have um, make a consensus on the uh, future development. And the building of a community is the social aspect of making a new village that's also very important for the sustainability once the momentum began then momentum should should continue by the involvement of the people thank you thank you thank you so much so the next presentation is of our professor Inya Tarin Holde and uh, as well it is based on some case studies Please, professor. Oh. good morning everyone uh, for, for, for some time i saw to turn out my presentation and I suppose um, I will try to explain for the, everyone here why we should not blame politicians for what they did and for decisions they made. Because sometimes they are also captured by some kind of weak problems and they simply can't step outside their shoes and to make another type of decisions. But let's, let's go in detail. Uh, this, the, my story is about uh, past dependency of public administration reforms in life. Uh, and actually, usually we try to explain reforms like our uh, motifs, tendencies for better governance, for better institutions, for better regulation, and etc. etc. So, usually when we come and try to explain why reforms happened, we try to explain that we need to develop, de deliver better services for our citizens, we need to involve citizens, and all of this will make our life better. Yes, it's true. But at the same time, let's look on this from the, a bit different perspective. Why we sometimes make the same mistakes again it's like putting it very simply that we should not repeat old mistakes and make the new ones, but we so do love these old mistakes that we continuously repeat them once and once and once, and then we are saying, okay, next time I'll be a bit smarter, but again, it comes back to the same mistake. So actually, this is uh, about the driving forces for it works. What explains our key decisions why we decide to go for a certain reform instead of just stopping and accepting the status quo as it is? It, it's about actually the, the way 
how decision makers perceive all kinds and types of reforms. And here I could say whether it, we are discussing reforms at the central level, whether we are discussing reform at the local level, from time to time we might capture themselves by thinking that decision makers again are following certain patterns, and etc. Et and then this is also a quite interesting situation. We all have heard, especially at a very practical level, from time to time, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Poland, actually Central and Eastern European countries received good positive evaluations from international organizations from what you did. Yes, that, that was past, that, that was very uh, in our past. And how this positive evaluation or certain reward has affected organizations and civil servants? Does it really moti motivate them to continue these reforms? And if continue the reforms, in what way, in what pattern? Therefore, I try to explain and look on this from the perspective of past dependency. Usually, this theory is, is, is used to explain what's going on in, in the economy. But uh, at the same time, it can help us to explain what's happening also with the reforms, why uh, administrators make certain decisions as they, as they make. So first of all, everything starts with the, with the assumption that false dependency is some kind of movement with a high probability that the more you invest, in the, invest efforts in this movement, the more you will stick to this pattern of action, behavior, or model. Because, hey, we are rational. The more we invest, the more we are interested in to get some kind of benefits out of our action, pattern, and model. So, seeing that we are being like trapped by our own motives and, and, and decisions. And of course, there is certain causality between our previous actions and future steps, or just put it simply, our Yesterday's decisions affect our tomorrow's uh, decisions in life. And of course, the crucial role here is by organizational behavior. The organizations, again, whether it's in the local level or the central level, when they get rewarded or when they get positive relation, especially from the international experts or look from, from community, they have tendency to lock in, to stick to the certain and to this positively rewarded model of, of behavior and continue all kind of actions with this particular model. The explanation is very simple because they like this model. They like our behavior. It's the same behavior like for a kid who finally cleaned up the room and mom get uh, rewarded his behavior with a handy. So, and there is a ready-made pattern. Cleaning up a room is a way how you can get, can get a handy. And with organization, with organizations, we have actually the same approach. Once organization has been rewarded for making good policy, it's most probable that in the next time, organization will stick to the same type of a policy, the same type of policy tools and instruments because it's already proved that it works. Why then to invest something else which might create some extra problems? Of course, in a past pandemic, everything starts with a certain historical event, and then this event turns out in a certain way, forcing process, pushing us and pushing organizations to do something, and once you did, then this is a part of your organizational memory, and again, it, it sticks and it, 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 it plays here. An organization accepts that this is an action how organization should behave, and this model of behavior has been actually transported, transferred to all kind of relations with any other bureaucratic agent. So this explains when you're looking or for sometimes for reforms and you can't understand why your Ministry of Local Governments do as they do, because they could do in another way. But no, they, in a, some kind of, I would say, even stubborn way, uh, keeps to the same model, because they simply can't do it.
another way because they found out this is a policy as it works, or at least they see that it works, and it's so hard to change the bureaucratic logic and in an institutional memory to go in other way, in other action. Uh, how it looks in Latvia? Yes, since I'm from Latvia, it's, it's, it's easier maybe to explain our decisions than other ways, but I really do believe that you will find something in common. Because to my mind, sometimes um, Latvians are saying that we have everything uh, better than our neighbors, or vice versa. The best, or best thing we, what we do have is our neighbors. So, and, and therefore, we are looking for our neighbors and, and really trying to, to take some models from Lithuania or Estonia. But it starts with a with a, with a, with a uh, Latvia. Then just to explain the whole reform over the past 20 years, everything starts actually back in 1995 with the negotiations with the, with the EU and the actually association agreements signed in 1995 uh, expressing a uh, main foreign policy goal that Latvia wants to be part of the EU and afterwards part of, of NATO. Uh, this, of course, created certain set of conditionality to be prepared for, for the membership. And as all you remember, the process when we start, when, when we negotiated and prepared themselves for being members of the EU, it, it, it includes certain conditionality, negotiations, uh, in, a, in a different chapters, requests to fully cope with the requirements of a third. This required that we build some institutions, we write down new type of laws and regulations, and here comes this point that all these efforts are uh, invested in to cope with the requirements and conditionality and, in, and, and of course, as far as I remember, Latvia uh, and Lithuania, they even created special task forces or special units to be the key leading bureaucratic force to cope with the EU requirement, actually this organizational unit accumulated fantastic amount of institutional memory uh, how to deal with conditionality. And of course, during negotiation stage, uh, foreign experts came up with, a, with, with some kind of recommendations, and believe or not, these recommendations help us to cope with the all these uh, huge amount of the accumulator again, because these were some kind of ready-made recipes, what we had to do, and of course we did. And now looking back from uh, to, to this time, I was like listing many and many government reports from the period of pre-accession and negotiations, and I found out that now there is some kind of sweet memories from that time because we did a great job. We managed to be in the club. We managed to cope with the conditionality. So, sweet memories, ready-made recommendations, together with the, with the efforts invested in the process, actually constituted a very important part of institutional memory, how to cope with any kind of conditionality Reform management. Just to just to explain how it how it, how it was just to, you know, some kind of visual effect in that time, and then this institutional memory helped when the next round of negotiations come with the with the same conditionality, with the same requests, with the same actually uh, special task units to cope with the negotiations and all the. Uh, about the membership. And in this case, this next round was Latvia's negotiations to be a part of OECD, but what we achieved last year. But actually, the way was the same. Uh, uh, yes, but if I put it in a such a way that we are like continuing one round, next round, next round, but then of course you could ask what about the innovation, whether there is some space for governance innovation, because it seems that if we stick to the past dependency, there is no room for governance innovation. Actually, these historical events may be one of entities factors for reforms. 
or driving factor for norms, but actually what sometimes we researchers really can't explain properly for practitioners, this is about how different combinations of driving factors, antecedent factors can uh, affect administrative innovation. What plays the larger role? Either these are some kind of environmental factors, because now the administration or society is ready for reforms, whether these are some kind of organizational factors, like organization has lack of resources or actually complete lack of resources, and this is a motif for, for changing some kind of behavior, or sometimes the individual factors are much more important than any others. And the point is that uh, usually we are tended these factors to look as a independent, like saying, yes, that's what one particular factor has made a crucial decision. That's why we do have, have reforms. But actually, we should look on a combination of different kind of factors. It's like mathematics. Because by summing up different factors, we really can't understand what happened and we can't ignore any kind of links between different factors affecting organizational behavior when they come to some kind of models how to make good policies. Of course, when we are coming back to the second round of, of reforms, I should compare our negotiations with the EU and then negotiations with NATO I could ask a very simple question. It's actually a question. What was before? Whether before uh, Latvia started reforms because there was a pressure, international or internal pressure, whether we wanted to be in the EU or maybe EU wanted to have us on the board, or we start reforms because we already have some kind of structures and institutional memory and we simply need to utilize structures and memory for making government relations. So, actually I suppose this might be some kind of open question. What was the first, chicken or egg? Or maybe put it in a simple way, how I started, don't repeat old mistakes. Make the new ones, make the innovative ones. Thank you. Professor Iveta, uh, and now, last but not least, the presentation of two of our uh, uh, University researchers is uh, Jurgita Mikolaikite and Diana uh, Shaparniene. As Diana is uh, not. Yes, <laughs> not in a very well conditioned, so Jurgita will present uh, alone the presentation. So. It's working, yeah? Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I, wa I would like to thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to be on the plenary session. Uh, Diana, my professor, my supervisor, my PhD, she told me to say that she's very sorry, but due to the sickness, I will represent today our research, which was carried on during my PhD. So this is the child of mine of five years hard work. Uh, and before I was asked here to, to give a speech of my research, I was thinking actually very hard, how do I fit, how do, we and Diana fit with our topic in local self-governance and good governance. Uh, because all those four years I was uh, dealing with collaborative value creation uh, in cross-sector partnerships and I was looking into NGOs and business organization cooperation partnerships to see what kind of value they are creating, what types of value they are creating and how those organizations are benefiting and actually how they create co-creation for societies, some value which can be captured for some society organizations. So, uh, to begin with, I would like to connect my topic with good governance. Uh, 
uh, good governance, corporate social responsibility, and cross-sector partnership. So how we fit, fit with our research. Uh, I was looking for different definitions of good governance, and I found one which is actually very helping us today. Uh, so, from this perspective, uh, good governance today will be understood from organizational point of view, and it's connected as well with social corporate responsibility from business organization point of view. Uh, good governance can be the effective and responsible management of organization and, of course, of country, which includes considering society's needs in decisions it makes. Uh, Moreover, good governance also calls for corporate social responsibility and social responsible investments as conditions for existence of market aim, fair distribution for well-being among and with communities. Uh, when I was doing our research, I noticed that uh, cross-sector partnership is not a new thing. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, business and NGOs already were cooperating, uh, creating uh, collaborative value, but when I was trying to look into the scene and context, I really uh, was struggling because when I started with some exploratory interviews and I was asking what, like, what kind of value uh, you are getting, especially when I was asking the business organizations where they were like, oh no, no, we are not getting value. We are helping society, we are helping NGOs, we are giving them money, you know, we were trying to strengthen them. But after changing my strategy and finding different questions, I really found very interesting research findings that actually cross-sector partnerships for business organizations are used as an instrument uh, for their reputation building, uh, brand image, and for motivation of their work. Uh, then uh, today, which I will uh, represent for you. So moving forward, uh, my research objective is collaborative value creation cross-sector partnerships. And do have to uh, answer some research questions, for today I have main three questions. What factors actually stimulate and restrict collaborative value creation in cross-sector partnership? And here I have to explain that uh, in my research I'm using three different theoretical approach. One, resource dependence approach or platform where I'm trying to explain what kind of different uh, resources uh, organizations are using in the exchange relationship when they are creating collaborative value. Another one is relational government mechanisms. Uh, they are called soft mechanisms, uh, which actually is based on trust, solidarity, and social control forms, which are used for organizations in order to avoid opportunistic behavior. Uh, another one is a uh, process-based approach, where I'm trying to find out what kind of micro-processes actually has influence in cross-sector partnerships uh, they are developing and, uh, of course, uh, to collaborative value creation. So the second question is dealing with what governance mechanisms are used creating value in cross-sector partnerships. And the last one, what type of collaborative value can be created in cross-sector partnership? Uh, how I did it? Usually, you know, PhD students are very strict about uh, methodology, research strategies, because they are forced to explain everything very clear. So firstly, of course, because as later I will explain, I used abductive research strategy. I started with uh, literature review because I need to get some knowledge about my research and phenomena. So for this purpose, I use descriptive analysis. Firstly, I was looking for the articles uh, dealing with cross-sector partnerships, social innovations, value creation, uh, and similar um, concepts which are usually used for in order to, to reveal that kind of phenomenon. And then I applied thematic analysis, so I reduced the amount of the literature to 146 articles, and after literature analysis, I found some uh, theoretical frameworks which, following the abductive research strategy, I implemented for my research questions and uh, semi-structured interview. Uh, what are the main findings from systematical literature review? 
so as always confusing uh, we want clarity in our research but actually i can't give you uh as i as i'm saying clear concept of what is collaborative value i can say that it's very uh multi-dimensional concept which can be analyzed from different perspectives and in my case i narrow down that i will analyze it from the types of the sources from organizational point of view and from the different points micro meso and macro levels uh, used concepts for the research purpose and collaborative value creation and cross-sector partnerships uh, so i decided to choose the austin and satanide uh, concept or, or how they describe what is collaborative value creation so for me, collaborative value creation is a transitory and enduring benefits, uh, which are actually related with the costs that are generated due to the interaction of those two organizations. Uh, here is my research choices. Uh, as I'm calling myself uh, interpretivist, so I choose actually qualitative research. Uh, during my research, I really understand that collaborative value for all organizations I understand different. It depends on how those organizations is understanding what is value for them, how they capture that value. Sometimes uh, for organizations who are more experienced uh, with partnerships, with NGOs, for them it's more easier to capture or to appropriate the value to understand what is value and what is not value for them. So basically, uh, more they are connecting, more they have different kind of relationship, more partnerships are stronger. So in this way, uh, the subject subjective approach, sorry, subjective approach was implemented and partnerships I understand are still the developing process, uh, which can create value, but sometimes this value cannot be captured by the organization. Uh, different collaborative value types, which will be represented during my research for NGOs and business organizations. Uh, so by using Austin and Sydney, the theoretical framework, uh, I have been analyzing different four values at the meso level and micro level. So, Meso level are those collaborative value types which are appropriated at organizational level for NGOs and uh, business organizations. And micro values is those values which are appropriated uh, for the workers of those organizations, so for the employee. Uh, so for basic values, associational value, uh, transfer resource value, interaction values, Synergistic value. Uh, a little bit about my research strategy. Uh, I choose the adoption research strategy because I wanted to move forward from empirical world to theoretical world and to find the best matching themes which actually can explain and can be contextualized to the scene and case. So in to put in two words, I'm looking for the best explanation and trying to match the theory. So I started from theoretical knowledge, a literature review, but what is interesting for this research strategy that you are not finishing off and you all the time coming back and forward to the literature review. Uh, then I went to practical problem. I did exploratory research, which I'm gonna represent results for today for you. Uh, I had two, 22 interviews semi-structured interviews with NGOs, the strongest one NGOs in Lithuania, which have at least two, three years experience uh, working with a business organization. And those uh, experiences shouldn't be only philanthropic one. It should be transactional uh, or integrative one. And then I have nine interviews with uh, business organizations, which are basically international organizations. Uh, which have strong social corporate responsibilities and uh, as well which have at least two or three years experience with cooperating with NGOs. And the last target group of mine was 
uh, brokers, NGOs, and business organization brokers. Those persons actually help or they work as a mediators between business and NGOs. In simple words to say, they help to understand and to speak at the same level or the same language. And after this, I did a case study, but I'm not going to present for you today, so I'm not going deeper this because of the time issue. Uh, the results of exploratory research and main conclusions. I used content analysis, so here you can see a map of categories and subcategories of different dimensions of analysis which I have done. In order to answer my research question, those three main research questions which I represented you at the beginning, I uh, applied and tried to find the main dimensions and themes which can be discovered during my research. So as I told at the beginning, uh, I wanted to see if actually the context matters, if the context actually influence the result of cross-sector partnerships or collaborative allocation. From this point of view, I was looking for the main uh, factors, internal and external factors which influence in collaborative allocation. Uh, so for my findings, I see that uh, those factors can be divided in macro and meso factors. But to be honest, I have to say that I limited myself and I did not actually look into micro factors which can be influenced by the workers of the organization. So the main micro factors which actually stimulate cross-sector partnerships in Lithuania is related with a favorable attitude towards the international investor. And here I, I want actually to give some uh, attention and to explain why I emphasize this category. As you know, in uh, Western countries, uh, uh, NGOs and civil society actually was formulated by, by the people. And in the same case, I think Iveta, the same in Latvian case and Estonian case, it was actually formed by the pressure of external donors. So that's why in the same context, uh, NGOs actually love international components because they set the tendency how the uh, NGOs and the business organizations have to cooperate. And in order, uh, one of the interviewers said that in order to be competitive in the market, the senior companies are actually forced to do the same. They actually have to show, but as well they mentioned, even they don't have a strong social corporate responsibility, they have to show that they have it in order to gain competitive advantage. Another one very interesting um, factor which I actually found during uh, my research comes from the uh, macro perspective that European support as a limiting factor for the partnership between NGOs and business organizations. It, it is interesting because usually, you know, we love international dollars, we love money, we love program, but brokers, NGOs, even NGOs, and Business organizations altogether mention and emphasize that it doesn't create a collaborative environment because everybody wants this money to save and to give to the organization. So this is interesting from the point of view of the partnerships. Another one restraining factors from NGO level, for, I'm not speaking in microphone, is the lack of human resources. I'm sure it's not surprising for, for the Baltic States countries because Usually, well, in Lithuania, NGO is not yet strong because only 25% of our organizations have more than four employees at the organization. Uh, only 25% of them have website. Uh, so the main uh, restricting factors which uh, business organizations mentioned uh, and coming from NGO level is their capacity to act and their managerial skills. They say that they don't have those skills which actually business organizations require, such as time management, plan, marketing skills, project management skills, and so on. But later on, I will show you that partnerships with business organizations actually help them to gain those. 
And this is one of interactive value which uh, NGOs can gain during the partnership of cross-sector partnership. Uh, another one uh, map is related with the dimension of uh, cross-sector partnership stages because uh, the process and relational processes in cross-sector partnership governance depends on the potential value, uh, collaborative value creation. So here for the research purposes, I actually took two basic uh, dimensions uh, or stages. The first one is formation processes, and I limited myself to the partner selection strategies and criteria. So uh, I tried to look into uh, what kind of strategies a business organization is using when they're finding or looking for the partners. And for me, uh, well, quite surprising was uh, the answer that uh, they are looking uh, for the organizations of which actually has compatibility with mission goals and values of NGOs. Uh, because vice versa, when I was in NGOs, they said that actually business organizations, they are not emphasizing the mission and how this mission uh, fits to end your mission. They are well looking for the organizations uh, with stronger capacity and with the image because one of the basic of the main resources which NGOs can offer to other organizations is their legitimacy and their reputation. So when we were talking about business organization selection process, NGOs actually did not mention uh, that they feel risk. And I was thinking, like, why? Because when I was reading literature from foreign countries, from the United States, Great Britain, they said that opportunism risks in cooperation of, between business and NGOs are very strong one. Uh, it looks like they can come up very easily. But then I understand that in my research, uh, when I was asking the question, do you have a previous experience of uh, collaboration or partnership with this organization? All said yes. So it means that in the same context, everybody knows everybody. Uh, so you don't need actually to be afraid about the organization's reputation because you already know. You are personally as a person connected with other human beings. So basically, in this case, when we're talking about relational government mechanism, uh, we are not talking about contract or government mechanisms. When they're using contract government mechanisms, they usually they apply the function of coordination dimension. And what was interesting to me to find out that uh, usually contracts are asked by NGOs, not by business organizations. Because in this way, they feel more protective in order that business organization not using them too much. You know, I, I got some answers for interesting. Like, oh, they gave us like 50 euros and then they ask us to give them a bit advertising for two years. So basically this is more feel feeling obligation. And the last one, it's very important implementation dimension, is partnership institutionalization and government which is actually focused about uh, how much uh, governments and partnership as a strategy for implementing implement cross-sector partnership actually is institutionalized in the organization level. Uh, NGO, in the same case, uh, all NGOs have their strategy written that they are looking for the partners for the business organization. So in this, okay, my time is, yes, okay. Uh, so in this case, uh, it doesn't matter. But when I was looking at the business organization, I saw that those organizations who has their culture based on the partnership, which has uh, different kind of forms and mechanisms for governing uh, or management cross-sector partnerships, 
and whose philanthropic activities are integrated horizontally and level at the organization level are more successful and they are easily capture uh, more easily capture value for, for at the organization level uh, so moving forward you, here you can see the visualization of collaborative value types uh, for business organization as I said, uh, effectively, I, I choose categories such as uh, association, interactional, and standardistic. And at micro level, I try to find uh, effectively what kind of values I can explore during the research. Um, basically, uh, all kind of values which I was finding from the research results and from the research findings fit. Uh, to uh, theoretical readings, but what for me was interesting that uh, this, uh, international business organizations in Lithuania actually they uh, do not use the same social corporate responsibility at the global level. They actually try to see and to fit the context of Lithuania. Uh, so basically, those companies who are big ones and who is competing uh, by trying to find the best workers for their organization they see that association value helps them to recruit better workers and to retention them and interaction value is uh, helping them to uh, develop new connections and only few of organizations actually said that they create synergetic value uh, by offering new services for, for public society. Uh, and micro value is based on the that uh, business organizations are using uh, uh, cross-sector partnerships in order to, mo to motivate their workers. Uh, so it's kind of one of organizations said this is more cheaper than to buy holidays for them or to give extra holidays or whatever. And going quickly to the collaborative value types for NGOs, uh, mostly all NGOs said that the most valuable value which they get from business organization is process-based value, such as establish new relationships with business organizations, improvement or organizational management processes and expanding the processes of cooperation with business organization and taking over the business organization mindset. So, the, as I mentioned before, those collaborative value which actually helps them to build a long-term partnerships, which from business organization perspective was uh, always mentioned that this is the lack that NGO cannot offer. Uh, so in this perspective, I have to mention that those partnerships which I have been analyzing, they are for one to two years. Uh, so uh, that's why it could be that uh, interaction value was so important for all those organizations. And to finishing up, uh, here I came up, this is not a theoretical model. Uh, is it a framework? I couldn't say or argue, but this is the structure of my research and how I find different elements are connecting to each other. Uh, you can see that uh, partner context actually matters and different forces which uh, has uh, influence to different types of partnerships and here you can see that collaborative value creation potential depends on the partnership formation stage and the level of occurring of collaborative value depends on partnership implementation uh, level. It means on what kind of mechanisms, governance mechanisms, do they use contractual government mechanisms or relational government, relational government mechanisms. If they use relational government mechanisms, so basically more interactive value occurs. If they use contractual government mechanisms, it means that more associational value because they just want to get value from being associated with NGO or business organization. And I think 
I would finish with this. I had some recommendations, practical implementations, but I think we can discuss this later if you have some questions. You're welcome. It's, it's really time for everyone to ask one question, or at least uh, some questions, because uh, those questions who left behind or seen now it's time to, to, to reveal them and maybe to detail it in more detail as, as, as we have in the past. Let's see, open the floor with questions. Um, question about path dependence. Um, are there are there things that happen that break path dependency? Um, forms, charismatic leader. Curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, actually, my personal concern about the path dependency was also in the same way. What should happen to break the path and to change the path of the form? And again, Latvia's experience showed that the combination of different factors and, in fact, the negative evaluation of international donors is very strong motive to step out of the current path to take the, and to take the alternative path. But again, once the policymaker wants to step to another path, alternative path, then Again, they, they continue with the same approach. One, they receive the positive evaluation or reward from the national organization, then again, the cycle goes on and goes on. So maybe it sounds like merry go round. Uh, my question, I'm kind of interesting in innovation because I was dealing with social innovations and here you mentioned that uh, this not wanting to choose different paths means that it can be a restricting innovation. Uh, what kind of innovation, governance innovation, you absorbed or maybe not absorbed in Latvia during the last case? And does it really mean that if they choose the same path, uh, there is no any hole or space for any kind of innovation, administrative innovation. Uh, well, I suppose I could answer the first part of your question, and then I should enroll my colleagues, because, for example, the UK, US experience about the city-owned hotel, actually, revealed the same case as we do have in Latvia. But sometimes when you're looking in detail, what really municipalities own find not only hotels, you could find the printing houses, you could find the, the swimming pools, find the some kind of dancing halls, and etc. etc. So, uh, and uh, then it's a matter of how, how really to change administrative practice and come with innovations. And usually, uh, administrators or bureaucrats are quite, you know, I will not say lazy. They simply stick to their, their approach, and if they come with innovation, they, they, they come with a process innovation. They change, they try to change the process how they do work, try to minimize, try to shorten the process, but it's very hard for them to really go for some kind of innovations, like to privatize a big swimming pool, or to overcome some kind of previous um, uh, mistake. Just another example. In Latvia, we are now fighting very much to make the unified information system architecture for the public sector. And this is almost mission impossible. Why? Because after researching the state of affair, we found out that actually there are 177 different databases created, created all the databases accumulate personal data, information about citizens, but the key point is that 
So there is 177 databases that mean 177 different public bodies at the central and local level keeping this information. And the point is that these public bodies are not very willing to share with the public. They created so unique databases that sometimes we even cannot switch them together. But this is different, uh, different, different programming approach used. And now the key challenge is how to overcome, how to push these public bodies for innovation to finally make unified information database. Just to escape overlapping that everyone are asking you personally and the post office when you are just entering the post office. That is what we need to do. Maybe I could also find the So uh, I, I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure if these are examples of innovation or not. Yes, I guess. We're talking about innovation. Uh, I guess to some extent, yes. And some are very successful, some are failures. I think a lot of the innovation has been around, I'm going to kind of talk more about this later, challenges, big, big issues. A lot of wicked problem type things. We have a lot of innovative type activities that go on. Uh, and so um, I think we've got a lot of good examples. But a lot of the, the, the things that are driven Perhaps by path of people. Uh, a lot of it goes back to who's making the decision and the leaders and who the leaders are listening to. So I'm not sure I'm actually answering the question, but those are some examples. Good. Are there more questions? So I have a question to a uh, guest from South Korea, uh, Yang Li, Professor Yang Li. This is not a question about the essence of your presentation, but I've noticed uh, the wall uh, in Seoul. Does it mean that there is a wall surrounding Seoul, or is it kind of a historical monument only? And if it is a kind of a, uh, what is the function of this wall? Historical monument or uh, just a kind of a part of a urban policy? And if it is, so it is an issue there. Because for me, wall is a symbol of exclusion a little bit. Yes. So, is it an issue among people who live there outside the wall on both sides? Or this historical uh, monument, if it is only historical, this is not an issue, and it's not actually uh, 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 something that can be treated as from a uh, let's say, functional uh, approach. Yeah, the wall was built for defense of Seoul, um, court, and then the main part of the uh, street. And then now government wants to rebuild it to show that the um, traditional part of Korea to attract uh, tourists. And then you know, the wall was not maintained for a while. And it was built 300, 400 years ago. So now they are going to make the I have a question for Professor Lee also. I know that you've studied other shrinking cities, and I'm curious about what similarities you found in your work or what that means. I just passed a um, diagram there. It, it, it is a framework um, proposed by other um, professors and researchers. You know, there are various drivers of um, Shrinking cities. It's not generalizable. Yeah. You know, the industrialization or relocation of the factories, some political transformation. And in, in recently, most of the Western society, low fertility rate is a big cause of the problem. But then it varies. So, case by case, we have different lenses. So, I cannot give you the generalizable. Could I use the microphone? <laughs> so I really want to 
to tell us a little bit to our main issue of this conference, because it was about welfare society. And it's not just social welfare, it's very wide understanding of welfare, but even welfare society. So, what each of presenters would say from their point of view, what do you think uh, those, uh, this problematical area that you research, that you find, you have some findings there, how it helps for local or national management, national governance to, to create this, to keep this welfare uh, attitude. And for example, it's very interesting from your research that, you know, if you want to create value from collaboration, so you should understand what are you doing. It's not just have a partnership. So it should be deeper knowledge of your aims of the partnership. So it, it's much more wider concept that you uh, presented. So could each of professors please have some comments on that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the U.S. is very interesting right now. You may have heard that we have a new president. And our president does not appear to care about welfare society. Um, it's not really clear what he does care about. Uh, and so there's a lot of concern except himself. He cares a lot about himself. So, um, so I think that more and more it's going to be incumbent on local government to to care about society, welfare society, and, and to implement uh, innovations to deal with, with needs. Because I don't think we're going to be able to rely on our central government. Um, so that's a very big challenge for us, I think, at the local level right now. So partnerships, I know I talked a lot about the negative sides of partnerships in my presentation, and that's because I'm concerned about how we keep citizens involved and engaged. But partnerships are very prominent and can be very successful. And I'll just say, um, I'll talk about interlocal uh, agreements. And I I'm here with Scott Bovic, uh, who is a county administrator in the US. He's also getting his PhD degree from us. But um, he has a lot of experience at a, as a practitioner at the local level. And, and I think we'll be talking more later about some of this this afternoon. But we have a lot of agreements between local governments to work together in, in ways that have been very, very helpful. I think. So there's a lot more of that going on. And we also have a lot of other partnership activities uh, between NGOs uh, and government and uh, private sector organizations. So, so these partnerships have been very valuable. And there are a lot of positive attributes to them, and I think we're going to have to rely more and more on them because of what's going on at the central level. I don't know the exact question, but um, um, to solve the problem that I presented for the um, shrinking cities, we may think of three different approaches by three different governance modes, by market, by government, by network. One would say that um, by market, it will be competitive approach, make people bid for the, for the project. In the case, you know, underprivileged people may exclude it in the process. And the other will be authoritative approach by the government. If the government has free money enough to provide all the uh, services, that would be good. But um, you know, governments are, are limited in resources. So the network approach, it, it we call collaborative approach, is very important in the case of that uh, specific case. The progressive uh, non-governmental organizations were against competitive approach that they wanted to make an example to other other similar uh, villages. So 
involved in some way. And then I think that in the time of limited resources, we have to use more and more of that collaborative approach. And then some, some big companies are interested in at the latest stage because it's good for their company's reputation corporate social responsibility. So even though it does not make, they cannot make a big money, they can make a reputation out of I would say so, but um, the reports and the challenges and the wicked problems which change our perception of local status. And to my mind, we should look on the Offer state, such state who is capable to ensure the food security for its citizens. So it's about the physical, economic, social, political, and the legal duties of their citizens. And once citizens feel insecure and safe, then this is offer state. But again, in order to achieve security, feeling of safety, certain structures govern. And actually, uh, just by reading one of the research about the Afghanistan, I found out how important is good governance for the government. Because as you know, uh, Afghanistan, despite all of our stereotypes, is, is, is rather physically secure state. But 90% of population depends from agriculture. Here comes the next point. The persons who are involved in agriculture, they, they, their wealth and income depends very much from the grand And now it's actually the huge governance problem how to change their approach and how to ensure the, the basic outcome. And therefore, actually, one, the country will dissolve and will ensure that, yes, there is a development and there is a also my mind, a good governance is a precondition for, for development. Well, uh, my first question uh, welfare state, uh, welfare society, and it's about sharing responsibility. What I was trying uh, to show today that. It's no more anymore just for public administration institutions or public government institutions or for the government. This is what we should do together. And as Iveta mentioned, and as the professor mentioned, it's more on the local level and responsibility for community. And community is not just a citizen. Everyone is a part of community. And I try to show that business organization is a part of community. NGOs business organization, local government. This is who now are responsible for social welfare at the national level, I could say, as well, and at the local level. So more they working, more they are trying to build the partnership approach, more I think they show their fairness, which is actually is one of the basic elements of welfare society. Much. So, therefore, I would like to encourage you to come up with a few questions or maybe some kind of questions or thoughts because we really debate so much and it's so wide the topic of governance and development in this country. And of course, we should remember that central government is really created to make work for the people, it's not just for the people. It, the municipality takes care of us from the birth to death. I would say so. Does anyone want to ask a question? Carol, uh, from a practitioner's level, on the public private partnerships, how do you engage the public or how do you set up a process where the public can have a role? In Uh, 
That's a good question, Scott, and I'm not sure I have an answer. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's challenging because in many of these cases, the decisions are driven by people who have specific interests, their own interests in mind. And I, so that makes it difficult. So as a society, we have, we have over the years, you know, we many years, decades ago, we had a lot of corruption in government. And so some of the institutions that developed, developed as a result of that corruption. And so we recognize that transparency and requirements for public meetings and public information, all of that helped to get rid of the corruption and rules for, for procurement. And all of those institutions were put in place to deal with that. And so now it's almost as if we're going backwards a little bit, I would say, in, in that we're opening the door for more, maybe corruption is too strong of a term, but we're, we're allowing more special interest uh, over public interest in some areas. And so I'm not really sure how to answer that. I, I think that we're going to have to find that better mechanisms to put in place to prevent some of these types of Maybe it's more um, open meetings, or maybe it's having citizens sit on committees. Uh, we have a, um, there's a development called tax increment financing in the United States that, that's used a lot for economic development at the local level. And there are some examples of cities where they have citizen boards for their tax increment financing. And so citizens actually review the applications for that. So maybe it's some type of mechanisms such as that that could help. But I don't really know, and I'd be happy to hear any suggestions from anyone. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Carroll, about uh, your uh, optimistic mood, uh, one of factors, uh, online participation. What is the area of participation and what is the recognition of participation? Because we in Lithuania, nowadays we have not solved the problem of, on, of online participation. That's a good question, thank you. Um, there are a number of different uh, ways that this is being used, and it varies a lot uh, uh, government to government. Uh, and there, every day it seems like there are new ways that, that this is happening. Some of it is as simple as, so I study public budgeting, so I, most of my examples are about budgeting. So there are examples where there are, there are organizations that will come in and help a government set up, um, I want to say a game, like a simulation where they'll say, okay, we need to balance the budget, and we have a gap of $1 million. And so how do you think that we should fix this? How should, what should we do? Do you want to spend more money on, do you want to spend less money on police, or less money on libraries, or should we raise our property tax? How should, so how should we come up with this million dollars? And they'll give a series of options and with some of the implications of doing that. If we have to take it out of police, we're going to have 500 fewer police officers or whatever. And so this, these types of things are a helpful way for citizens to understand how complex it is to balance the budget and, and what it really takes to pay for those police officers that they want so badly. Because they say they want police officers, but they don't really want to pay for them. So these types of activities are a good way for citizens to better understand what, those, what the connection is between the taxes and what they're getting so that's one example of some things that have been tried and used pretty successfully uh, in terms of online participation. Okay, my next question goes to a professor from South Korea. What is your opinion about uh, your, uh, that project evaluation? Because my opinion, it looks 
prolonged career and your network model isn't more broken. Because approximately 20 years and just small solution for start. Or I some this what is the reason for so long period of this urban village? In that specific case, it took four years to make a plan um, consensed by the residents and then later recognized by the district office. Four years is not that long, but four years is not. I think that um, to involve the citizens in the process, and those citizens are uh, experienced in, and then know their problems very well, but that they are old, not very intellectual. So it required external forces, encouragement from the uh, NGOs to, you know, this will be, maybe, your best interest. So I don't think it's um, too long. I'd be interested in hearing kind of generally or specifically the Lithuanian Latvia as relatively new independent country and many other countries that are represented here. What do you see as the major challenges in your countries right now at the local level? Uh, or what reforms have occurred that have been very positive that you've seen? Any major issues? Just generally that would But this is your question just in time because when we are discussing this governance, how do you demonstrate this country regains independence than from my perspective is about the huge challenge for everyone to take up responsibility, to, to learn to be responsible, to learn to be involved. And this is so hard that it's so nice to sit and wait for someone who comes and do the job instead of you. In that way, we have even the very fam famous fairy tale that uh, from time to time we are saying we want to have our lucky beer who will come and bring some with happiness and wealth. And he will know everything and he will help, but the point is that the lucky deal are really helpful. We can say that we so everyone is From Lithuanian uh, perspective, and I think uh, um, our guest from uh, local governance maybe could add something more because he has very wide experience being mayor, being uh, working in uh, administration, and even working with NGOs. <laughs> so maybe in Lithuania, and uh, we, will, we will try, I'm not sure how, but we will try to. So I'll try to be translator, sorry, <laughs> because there are 
not so much people who has uh, headphones to, to get the English language. So uh, what uh, our colleague said that uh, in the planning area we had the same as Iveta mentioned that the main thing that uh, it's uh, shrinking of Lithuania at all, because there are less and less people there, it's not just because they are living out the, of the demographical things. And uh, the other issue that uh, mentioned Eustinus is uh, regional policy, that uh, it's uh, very common with Yvette's, uh, Yvette's presentation that regional policy talking about development of regions and taking responsibility for that is, is um, I, I can't find the right word for that, but it's changing to the bad situation. Not developing as a good issue, but changing to more worse situation because the region policy in the Lithuanian case, we have less and less. That means that we have more and more centralization. So that is the main issue that I add a little bit <laughs> to the Istinus talk. Yes, but like this, that is a problem when we are at the 1990-1990. So and we have 27, and Istinus touched the issue of as one of uh, example of uh, um, citizens of Shoulei. Child. So, in 1990s we have we had 27,000 of children that could be pupils in our schools and uh, and um, attending our uh, kindergartens. But now we have 20, 13,000. So it's decreasing, amazing. <laughs> Ta problema tai miestas buvo pramoninis ir iš tikrųjų buvo orientuota į stambėją pramonę, mes turėjom kelti apie grupų, kurios jie dirbo 3 tūkstančiai, 5 tūkstančiai darbuotojų ir jie tapo nereikalingi ekonomiai. The crush of big factories as well is quite a big problem for Shoulei city and region as well, because we lost a lot of very strong, very important and not the world, not, not the world, making those factories who make big impact on uh, economical development of Shoulei and as well on the thing. And that lost in last maybe 15 years. And uh, another problem that we, uh, a challenge that Shoulei faced is uh, that we change our uh, status of the town because before uh, we were a very close city because of military, military uh, army and military airport that we had near the Shoulei. So Shoulei is, was quite spot on the, on the map. Uh, I think 25 years ago, even you can't find name of Shoulei on the map because we had military near. Now it changed, so because Russian army is going was deep, and uh, it's it's big big challenge for Shoulei as town. This changing of status of town and leaving of Russian army. Why? Because people should different situation. Those who live here and lived here now. Galėčiau vardyti įvertinti problemas iš tikrųjų. Tikrai manau, kad svarbiausia yra prisimti atsakomybę vietoje ir nepamėt per daug ne kaip dėmesio, kad jis nevardėjo nepamėtų. And the last word, word of Justinas was very common with everything that we talked. And I think it could be like summary of our morning session that really everyone, not just like citizen, but as well local governance, take responsibility. And even if he had some, if we have some uh, issues of centralization, that doesn't mean that someone will come and, you know, rescue us from that situation, this mystified 
uh, people or some some totems. So really, could I summarize a little bit of what we did today morning? So we, we really talk about different cases from United States, from Korea, from Latvia and Lithuania, but all those cases, I think, are very, had, has a very common uh, central idea that collaboration and uh, cooperation, I mean, hope everything what we have, could help us survive and not just survive being suffered for, but had, uh, have uh, this development situation. So, not only when we talk about taking responsibilities, but as well thinking about sharing of resources that we have, all kinds of resources. So, that could help us and had, had, that could influence on our decisions, even if we are local government, uh, people from local governance, or even when we are citizens of the so I think that <laughs> thank you everyone for this discussion and really I'm very happy about uh, uh, Justina that helps us to understand Shirley's situation.